there is power in a network, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that towards the end, but um, I want you to actually think about this, this notion that Sunir put out there about where is your distribution, and by the end of my presentation, my hope is that you're thinking about it in an entirely new way, but I'm going to take you on a trip um, going back in time, and my, I predate Sunir by many years in this, in this crazy industry. Um, and uh, I was telling him a little bit about the story of Constant Contact. So I was one of the, the early folks at Constant Contact. I got a couple of my buddies here from those days. Uh, started in 2001. We had 10 customers and $100 in revenue. Um, I did never ask the CEO uh, what the revenue was when I was interviewing. Um, and uh, when I joined, it was a massive surprise. We had no market. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to get these people, these small business owners. And along the way, you know, we've had a, we had a pretty interesting path. And I'm going to take you through the process that we went through and how our strategy evolved to actually get to the point where we had over half a million small businesses. Um, I like to talk with frameworks, especially when I'm talking about the past, because they help you to kind of conceptualize things better. So many of us have seen Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. I want you to think about this in terms of your market, right? Where are you in terms of your market? Are you at the earliest stage, the inception? Or have you already blown through the greatest growth and you're out towards the laggards? The interesting thing here is not to think about the curve, it's to think about the space under the curve. That is the market. Those are all the small business owners out there, right? And the person that gets the disproportionate share of that market is the winner, right? But the strategy needs to evolve and change as you go through this process of going down and around the curve. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we did that and how we won some elements of it and lost some others. The other interesting thing to note when you're thinking about selling to small business is how do you make a purchasing decision? We came across this notion about halfway into our life on building out constant contact, this notion of ADA. And ADA is a pretty simple concept, awareness, interest, desire, and action. It turns out that when we make a decision, we go through that steps process from A to A. And when we were selling email marketing, and in the early days when I did it, um, literally selling door to door uh, in Atlanta, um, we would go in and say, hey, do you want to do email marketing to these business owners? And they'd just throw us out of the door. And we're like, why, why don't these guys get it? And it turns out they weren't even aware that there was a way to bring their customers back. So we would say to them, hey, you know, we got kind of tricky. We walked into the business and say, this is a really cool business. Um, can I join your mailing list? Well, we don't have one. Oh, really? Well, how do you bring your customers back? Well, uh, you know, they just come back. Really? What if you had a way to bring them back? Oh, that's expensive. You know, I use postcards and stuff. It's like a buck per impression. Really expensive. What, what if it was a fraction of a penny? Oh, I'd be interested in that. So we'd give them a sheet of paper that said, join our preferred customer list, put it out on the counter, and then literally come back a couple weeks later, and the list would be filled with all of these email addresses. They weren't aware that there was a pain point that they could solve using email marketing. So we had to make them aware. Then we had to get them interested. So we got that piece of paper all filled out, and they're like, okay, now what the heck do I do with this? All right, I've got all these names. Well, now you can use a tool to bring them back. Right? And that gets them to take action and sign up and actually start using the product. Desire is a little bit different. Desire is for the people who are sort of later on in the curve that are like, yeah, I get it, I'm interested, but can you show me someone like me who's actually had success in doing that. And that's where a lot of the case studies and education comes into play. But if you marry these two frameworks together, you get a really interesting way to think about how you sell the small business. Right? So here you have your adoption curve. You have ADA down the left side. And the funny thing about an innovator is what? A very early stage person. They go to A to A, don't skip a beat, right? They're like, I want to be the first person to have this thing. I don't know what the heck it does. I'm in, right? And then they're followed by the early adopters who have a similar mentality of, I want to be first. I want to be out there in front of this thing. But as you start to penetrate the market deeper and deeper, friction comes into play. 
the I and the D come into play. And you need to find ways to actually nurture that relationship through the I and the D so you can continue to grow. Taking friction out of the equation was one of the things we used to talk about a lot. We used to call it um, Teflon or frictionless onboarding. How do you get people through and, and to get to the wow in the product without any obstruction along the way? And it's taking out that friction that happens to be more and more important as you go further down in the life cycle of selling to small businesses. So I married all those things together, and boy, that's kind of hard to read, but you don't really want to worry about the laggards anyway. And I'm going to tell you the story of um, winning the battle and ultimately what lost the war for constant contact. And if you see this right in 2001, here we are, there's you know, four, three or four players in the market, constant contacts, 25% market share. This is the early, early, early days of email. I mean, this was literally, SAS was called ASP. When I got to constant contact, January 2001, we were literally just for the first time moving off an installed application to an ASP application. This is a dark, dark, dark ages, folks. Um, and then, in 2002 to 2009, the battle raged, right? It was all about how to get up that curve and across the chasm, and we didn't really pay a lot of attention to each other. We just went at it. But you see, constant contact's strategy actually resulted in us almost becoming 50% market share uh, during that period of time. And then there was battle round two, which is why I say winning the battle and losing the war, because um, you can see that MailChimp, who's in the green in battle round one, um, at around a 10 to 15% market share, ended up capturing the lion's share of the market, a disproportionate share. So what I'm going to share with you now is a little about how it all played out. So um, when I was talking to Sineri, he's like, well, this is kind of like Star Wars and you know, battle stars and all that kind of stuff. So I had to work that into the, into the presentation. Uh, so 2001, small business owners are painfully searching for a cost-effective way to bring their customers back. Right? This was in the time of direct marketing. A buck, they'd send a Christmas or a holiday thank you card to all their customers, and that was it. Right? Email marketing became a painkiller. It wasn't a vitamin. And our, the venture backers that we have often talk about, is it a vitamin or a painkiller? Is what you're doing actually solving pain? If it does, you're going to get a disproportionate share of the opportunity coming your way. And they wanted a low cost and a real simple application. And really, in 2001, an industry was born. Um, now I'm going to talk about battle round number one. And uh, there are other people who are going to keep me honest in this between Kevin and Len, but I'll see if I can get it all right. So 2002 to 2009, Constant Contact really won the battle through three different um, major initiatives early on. The first piece of the equation was a partner strategy, right? And this came out of just contacts that we had in the industry and working those relationships. And the interesting thing about the channel strategy was after the fact, when we turned around and looked back on it, it was a very simple two-by-two two framework that we figured out. It was reach and influence. When we look to partner with other firms, we look to break down their reach and their influence with our target market. Now, we were a horizontal play, right? We were going after B2C, B2B, nonprofits, association, the whole gaggle of these guys, right? 60 million plus. And so we needed partners that had very big reach with very strong influence. What did we learn? Well, we learned that some of the biggest brands out there that have monstrous reach don't really have great influence, right? And that influence varies for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it was because we were a front office marketing solution and we would go to some of the big back office players. And we'd say to them, hey, let's partner. Can you introduce your people to what we have to offer? Sure, they'd do an email out to all their customers and we'd get crickets. Like, wow, that's kind of weird. And then we'd find a smaller partner 
who had less customers but were right at the same lifetime, right? You have to have a customer to be doing email marketing, right? So who else was in the marketing side of things that had a lot of customers? And it turned out the website guys had that in spades. So those are the people that we partnered with early on that literally started to spin the flywheel. So at the time, it was Network Solutions. You may remember them. They're now part of web.com. Um, but they had the lion's share of folks with URLs, and they were the ones that we turned to, and they got our partner pro program cranking. But that's not to say that people with smaller reach and high level of influence weren't important. We started to work with partners like the um, Arizona Small Business Association, the Chambers of Commerce, and that was really tough, right? Because they're, you know, they're jockeying for trying to get you to pay to join their association, and we had to work through a model to figure out how that was all gonna play out. But it turned out over time that they became a very influential market for us because they were at the grassroots level. They had trust established locally, which meant they had very high influence. So sometimes as you're looking at partners and you go, eh, they only got 30,000 customers, da, da, da. but if they're in the right sweet spot, you can actually get a lot more out of them than someone like an Amex, because they have the influence with the people you're trying to sell to. The second thing we did was kind of, um, uh, it was actually right before my time, when we set the pricing strategy for the product, right? We set a flat fee per month. I think at the time it was like $15 up to 500 email addresses or something. And it turned out that a lot of the early adopters, the people with the greatest pain, were nonprofit organizations that needed to talk to a membership. And they were already spending that dollar per week or per month trying to communicate with their members at the time. And our pricing attracted those folks. Whereas all of the other players in the market were doing it as a price per email sent. So that made them think every time I send an email, I'm going to lose. So our pricing strategy really helped us there. The other thing was we had a 60-day free trial. Everybody else in the industry had a 30-day free trial. Turns out all the conversion happened in the first four days anyway, so it really didn't matter. So what did going to 60 days do for us? simply opened the top of the funnel. It put more people in. Because when you say 30 days to a small business owner, they go, ooh, I don't have time, I'll get back to it, they've gone. When you say 60 days, for some reason, that's eternity. You don't need to go to 90, it's just 60 worked perfectly for us. 60 was like, oh, I can, I can get to that in 60 days. In reality, it all happened in the first four days anyway. So that helped us drive market share and awareness. And finally, um, we evolved towards human touch, right? We realized that small businesses wanted to talk to somebody. And while uh, some of the other folks were taking their 800 number off their website, we put it even broader on the top of our website, invited people to call us and talk to us. And we found that we actually, when we called people during trial, it dramatically increased the conversion rate from like 17% to 30%. So that was a huge play that we did. So education and human touch really draws them in and draws them closer. Throughout all of those things, that allowed constant contact to really go up that curve at the steepest growth part of the curve and win. We clearly were battle round one winners. And then, the chimp attack. What changed? How could we be that asleep at the wheel? Well, a funny thing happened in 2007. We went public. MailChimp, uh, Ben Chestnut, good friend, um, never raised a dime of money from venture. It was just a, a product that he and his uh, co-founder had built out because people were asking them to build their websites and said, can you do email for us? So they just built out this cool little app called MailChimp. And he looked at it and he's like, well, you know, Constant Contact's here and they already got this big market share, but there's all of these people that are in the middle bucket that haven't yet gone their way. And what he did, and this was, you know, it was timing was perfect, it was right when <laughs> Small Business Web was taking off, he's like, freemium! 
We're like, freemium. And we'd actually studied this a bit, and we're like, oh my God, our, our investors would kill us, right? We just went public. There's that old adage of, you know, eat your own lunch before someone else does. Um, they came into the market with their freemium offer. It really set us back, because we were trying to figure out how do we compete with them and stay keeping revenue and analysts happy and all that kind of stuff. And it really opened the door and allowed MailChimp to go after the market in a pretty substantial way. In addition to that, they had multiple S-curves. They had this thing called Mandrel, which was their emailing engine that they were using. And that provided them with a completely alternative source of revenue by being the back office mailing engine for a lot of other apps that were out there. So he could essentially you know, use the same infrastructure and generate two streams of revenue. So while he was going into the middle section of the growth in email marketing, he was growing up the outside, a high growth curve, on the email delivery side and making a ton of money over there at the same time that they were capturing this freemium market. Oh, the other thing I forgot to point out is back in, in stage one, Constant Contact's net promoter score was in the mid-30s. By the time we got to 2009 to 2015, it had dropped significantly. I was talking to Len a little about this earlier. Uh, my theory or hypothesis on it was this is after we bought single platform. And the reason was we turned our customer list over to single platform and we let them have at it. So they were dialing for dollars, calling all of our customers, and what do small businesses hate the most? An unsolicited phone call, right? Seven on average per week, and it drives them actually bonkers. So we let them loose on our customers, and the net promoter score dropped. At the same time, MailChimp's net promoter score went up. That's how they won, ultimately, the war. There is that, that element of human touch, though. What did they do to solve that problem? Well, the way they solved that problem was through Freddie, their monkey, right, and his voice. They created this beautiful blog. They were letting, letting people do self-help, whereas we were trying to actually let them talk to somebody. And he literally would say to people, you want to talk to somebody? That's fine. Go to Constant Contact. And he would send people our way. He wanted the people who would self-teach. And it turned out to be the lion's share of the market. So now he has roughly 12 to 14 million businesses in his bailiwick. He owns the pond, right? Right now, when, it's, when you think about cost of acquisition, he has 15 million people inside his pond, and he goes fishing there, because they're already addicted to his product. All he needs to do is get them to graduate up from 2,500 email addresses, and he can start to charge them money. In the meantime, all the other players have to go after the laggards. Very high cost of acquisition, very difficult to get at. That makes sense? Cool. So a couple of key takeaways about what we learned in selling to small businesses. Number one, it's constantly evolving. There is no silver bullet in selling. We love to say this. There's no silver bullet. It is a thousand different things acting in your behalf that gets you there. In addition, ADA grows. The importance of, of making sure you're addressing interest and desire grows as you saturate the market. You need to invest more in education. You need to invest more in customer stories and getting those stories front and center for the skeptics that are later stage. And brand trust, your net promoter score, really, really matters. It is the only counter that you have to a rising cost of acquisition. Now, once Constant Contact got to 50, 30,000 businesses, we were profitable. We started to do radio and print and, and all that kind of stuff. Those things were running us three to four to five to seven hundred dollars per ad, right? Per acquisition. And the only thing that you can do that actually has a very low cost of acquisition is to turn your customers into your sales force. And the best way to measure that is the net promoter score. So how you're doing, the higher your net promoter score, the more wind you have at your back helping you sell, right? Because it's how likely are you to recommend this brand to another small business. So if it's very high, they've got your back. If it's very low, you're having to kind of counter them to try and sell your product. 
So I'm really going to date myself here, and I'm going to go back to the future, a whole different movie series. right? Um, so this is when I came out of college. Um, this is how we sold, right? Selling and marketing was all traditional. Broadcast, print, have an outbound sales force if you were an enterprise seller. A dial for dollars, you know, buy a list from InfoUSA where I used to work many, many years ago. And, you know, hand it to a bunch of 20-somethings and let them dial, lo go loose, right? Add to, you know, really piss off small businesses by adding to that seven, make it eight or nine. That really makes them happy, right? Or, um, you know, on the consumer side, it was print. So why did we do this, right? We, we knew what our demographic was, and we literally would buy an ad in a newspaper or a magazine when we knew they hung out. And we would throw it out there. And hopefully it landed in the right place. They'd see it, they'd come in, they'd call us, they'd know about us. And you know, literally, we were paying $100,000 for a full page ad in CTO Magazine or whatever. Right? Then a funny thing happened around 1998. And this is a time I was actually at Alta Vista. Um, anybody remember Alta Vista, the mountains? Awesome, got a bunch of old people. OK, um, 98, Google comes onto the scene. And what changes? Well, all of a sudden, the people we want to reach are kind of already telling us what they're looking for, right? They're filling in a search box. That's pretty cool. All I have to do is be there when they, they type in that search box and be present. Neat. SEO is born. Other people start to figure that out. Want to be there too. PPC is born, right? That happened around 2000, no, it was about 2000. It was PPC was born. Right? And so we start jockeying for position to be the top one. And then they're like, ah, screw that. We're going to sell everything. Get everybody up there. And it became a, um, an auction, right? And so then we're like, wow, we're starting to pay more and more for each lead that we're getting from search. And so inbound marketing was born. Right? And what is inbound marketing? It's nothing more than putting a, a white paper out there to try and grab their contact information so you can continue to bombard them until they you know, either buy it or unsubscribe. Right? But that whole industry happened from 98 to 2006, not that long ago. So here's what, I, you know, when Sue was talking a little bit about your distribution channel, here's what I want you to think about. Social media changed the game in many respects. LinkedIn. Right, so there my demographic was basically saying, I'm looking for you. LinkedIn created a whole new dynamic. I know exactly who I want to reach at Microsoft, and I just need to find somebody who knows that person who trusts both of us. Right? Social media is all about trust. Coming back to that net promoter score thing again, right? The higher the trust, the more likely people are going to advocate for you, the importance on social media. All right. So now I can get access to the people I want to sell to without even having to worry too much about PPC and SEO and all that stuff. Did it happen on consumer? Hell yeah. I mean, Facebook, Snapchat. My kids don't even use Facebook anymore, um, which I thought was kind of my, now once, once their mother got onto Facebook, it was like, I'm gone. They're on Snapchat now. But the whole idea here is it's all about reputation and the network of those people that trust you and how they influence others that you can now tap into. So when people ask me to explain what is Alignable, what are you doing now, that's what we're doing. We basically have created a social network for small business owners that allows them to connect and network and build trust with each other. We're adding literally thousands of businesses every day. It's all viral. And it's taking off. Why is that important to you? Because you need to understand what changes when social media enters your market. What do we know about that transition from enterprise to, and consumer to social media? Who owns their brand now? Does JetBlue really own their brand? Or do all of their customers using Twitter own their brand? Right? With social media, brand ownership shifts. Right? So you need to anticipate that shift in ownership of your brand and make sure that you're thinking about it. Now, this is not the only path to acquisition. It's merely the next path. Right? There was the way we went at it with constant contact with 
the virality of our user base and who signed up first. It turned out that those nonprofits that joined early on in constant contact time had tons of small businesses on their lists and they drove a huge viral engine for us. But then freemium came to play, right? And now the next thing that's coming to play is social media. And all of those things make up your go-to-market strategy. So you need to be aware of them. You need to focus on building trust. Building trust is not dialing for dollars and harassing your customers. Right? When we started Alignable, we literally started because my co-founder, who actually won an Academy Award for Star Wars stuff, uh, believe it or not, while he was at Stanford, smart guy, um, he was going trying to sell a mobile app to small businesses in our hometown, and it was literally to push advertisement to customers coming by. And the guy literally said to him, Venkat, that's really cool. I'm never going to buy it. But I know you're talking to the guy that owns the wine store across the street. Could you just introduce me to him? His parking lot's always full, and I want to meet the guy. And Venkat, being a technologist, is like, what? It's kind of like a bad chicken joke. Why won't the small business owner cross the street? Well, what, how does the, that phone call, that, you know, that seven phone calls a week, they, how does that start off? Is the business owner here? Business owner available? So you think a small business owner wants to cross the street and walk into another small business and go, hey, is the business owner here? I'd love to talk to him. No. They need something to break the ice. And that's what a social media platform does for them. It allows them to literally connect with the person across the street. And that's what's driven our growth. Um, it's important to understand your segment NPS scores. Now, I know this is kind of funny because you ask any one of the people in this room, what's your NPS score? No one will tell you. It's a personal kept secret. Yeah, we blew all that up. So we're, um, before I go there. These are the net promoter scores. We have over 100 brands, over 15,000 ratings. I've got a bigger print out of this if anybody wants it. Um, it's kind of an eye chart. It, and it goes based on the life cycle of business. right? I, I establish my business. I incorporate. I set up my business. I start to grow customers. So you get lead management, email marketing, operating my business, accounting services. You know, It's kind of hard to read, but you've got QuickBooks up there at a positive 30. And then I want to expand my business, so I want to go online with Shopify or Big Commerce. You know, are these 100% accurate NPS scores? No. They give you a perspective, right? These are users who are within the hundreds of thousands of businesses on Alignable that have done ratings and reviews. But it gives you an interesting perspective. For example, On Deck Capital. Is anybody familiar with On Deck? Yeah, anybody uh, from On Deck? No, okay, good. So, their CEO went out and said, we have a positive net promoter score of 76. First of all, I've never seen anybody with a positive 76 net promoter score. On a, on a lineable, it's negative 44. Why? When they do a net promoter score, they take it when the person just got money. They just gave them a loan. How likely are you to recommend us to somebody else? Eh, pretty high. Turns out, once they figured out that they're paying an 80 to 40% APR, um, or they got rejected for a loan, they have a little bit different opinion. A social network embraces all of those opinions, the positive and the negative. You need to think about that when you're doing your NPS, right? Get as many people in the pool as you possibly can to get a true score, and that's what we've done for the market. So we're continuing to release this on a quarterly basis. We don't charge for it, we just make it available because we want everybody to get better at doing this. Are, are they having conversations about you and your brands? Absolutely. You know, these are conversations about Facebook and Square. You know, the Square guy jumps on and says, I'm not impressed with Square. I have business friends who use it, but I, use, I prefer PayPal. Another guy in, smiling dog photography, says, I wouldn't knock Square until you actually use it. We move from PayPal to Square and love it. Square's da 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 da, right? They're talking about you. They're helping you sell. Embrace them, and they will help you drive saturation in a market. So when Sneer was saying about the, the distribution um, being you know, just the people in this room, I'd encourage you to also think about all of the other small businesses out there. They're critical to our lives. Um, they're important to our economy. Um, trusted recommendations, they trust each other for who they should use. So if you can be the one that they talk about, you win. Right? Um, embrace it, deliver awesome solutions, and you will win a disproportionate share of that space under the curve.
How did I do on time wise? Okay? I have time for questions. And my, I may call on my friends from Constant Contact. So, any questions, thoughts, concerns? Did it make you think differently? Yeah. What would you have done differently at Constant Contact given uh, your strength within uh, being public? That's a great question. So, the question was what would we have done differently um, because we were a public company at the time that the freemium was coming out? We actually had an offsite with the entire exec team, and we tried to figure out how to do freemium. Um, in hindsight, I think we, we should have done it, um, but that's easy, right? That's Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, the other thing was we could have looked at the distribution of our ARPU and where it was coming from and realized that the larger accounts that we had, um, we could increase the pricing there and maybe offset the, the, the smaller guys quite significantly. So shifting a little bit more towards the, back, the, the larger accounts could have given us a little bit of runway where we could have done something on a freemium standpoint. Um, any other thoughts, Kao? We could have done? <coughs> no. Nailed the third product. Nailed the third product, yeah, we struggled. So the whole idea is when you're going up that S curve, you want to be introducing your next application, your next product, at, at right when that S-curve starts to take off, because it takes that time to build up. And that's what MailChimp did with Mandrel. So you have more, you know, um, uh, more irons in the fire, I guess is the best way to put it. And we struggled in terms of what was an, another growth curve and what was merely a feature for email marketing. So we added events. Well, that's just a feature. That's not a new market. Right? And then we, we tried to believe, believe ourselves into the fact that that was a new market, and it turned out it wasn't. It was just a feature. Um, we talked a lot about going international, and international doesn't give you a new curve. It just shifts the curve out a little bit. Um, so, you know, it buys you a little time, but that doesn't give you the ramp that we needed. But great question. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Eric. Great presentation. Just curious about constant contact. I'm here. Oh, thank yeah. you. Just some thoughts on how you guys have evolved to maybe even move into mid-market, say, you know, starting out with the real small, zero to five employees plus, but then moving up higher, up the curve? Yeah, so when you go up market, a bunch of things change, right? You know, everybody, I was on the board of Big Commerce, um, and we battled this a bunch, and they actually went up, up market. Um, and it's a different solution set, right? We were a self-service, you know, we had the, the, the call center you could call and get support, um, but we didn't have a lot of account executive type people, right? And so we had a professional services team, but they really need more than that. They want someone to literally help them and do it for them. And so we chose to go the reseller route on that and to work with people that could provide those services rather than build it up ourselves. But it does change that dynamic. Now, our resellers were great because building out that market, when you buy from a reseller, you're, you're even less likely to churn um, because you're kind of dependent on them. So, you know, mid-market, great from an ARPU standpoint, great from a, um, a churn reduction standpoint, just really tough from a, you know, infrastructure required to actually do it well. Um, and if you got more questions about that, talk to, to Kevin and, and Len, who literally built that whole organization. Yeah. One short question. Yeah. Uh, can short, you share? Yeah. So can you share any specific challenges that you have faced while uh, going with channels? Especially I'm looking for uh, uh, any channels in the form of point of sale systems. Uh, have you explored those? Payroll sale? Uh, no, point of sale systems. Uh -huh. uh, because small businesses predominantly use them uh, and then that could be one of the channels to, you know, to push your okay, solution. So did you say payroll? Or uh, no, portal. portal. Port of sale, point of sale. Point of sale, POS. POS systems, perfect, got it. Um, so. You know, I, I would actually defer to those guys on the, the partnerships. Um, you know, I think that the POS, again, was back uh, side, and we were on the front office, they were in the back office. Um, but to the extent that we can enable payments through the emails, we had some good successes with some of those folks. Um, but it really wasn't a partnership that we were actually, uh, I don't think we leveraged very well um, from when I was there. <laughs>